The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good day, everyone. Well, we uh, see that the uh, market is making a uh, pullback of sorts. Um, it's had a big run-up, and uh, the odds of a rate hike at uh, the December meeting is now at 68%. It, it kind of fluctuates between that and 70 so it's a lot higher than it was um, on the basis of what the uh, Fed was saying. Um, we also had uh, uh, another Fed uh, governor, Bullard, um, earlier today say that uh, it's time to raise rates. So the markets, I think, were a bit uh, soggy on that news. Um, the markets like the idea of rate hikes uh, if, if indeed the economy is on the mend. But on the other hand, they don't like the idea that it means uh, money is not going to be as easy, perhaps, going forward. Um, but there's a lot of hands here, because on the other hand, the Fed, perhaps, um, well, we know the Fed's bullish, so we know, uh, dovish, rather, so because of their dovish nature, they, if they do one hike, it might just be a token hike, um, and then they're, you know, they certainly want to be very gentle about how they're going to hike rates. So if, I think you're going to need to see enough evidence that the economy is actually on the mend. Uh, before they start hiking, say, for a second time. Uh, so it's probably going to be a very slow process, and I think the market does like that, uh, knowing that they're going to be gentle about it. Um, we uh, talked about how, you know, these uh, indicators that the Fed likes to rely on, you know, like the, uh, the, uh, the jobs data and whatnot, you know, the 5% unemployment rate. Um, these statistics are all a bit suspect, as we discussed. And uh, I think the Fed is aware of that, um, and certainly uh, the rest of the world is having a lot of trouble uh, getting back on track economically, um, and their markets are a reflection of that. So, you know, because the world is so connected, um, it's unlikely that the U.S. can just all of a sudden uh, pull out, in, you know, and main, maintain its pole position, um, lead economically, e even if the rest of the world is... is deeply lagging behind. I mean, inevitably, it will affect the U.S. economy. Um, you know, and then we also have this whole thing about the inflation data, um, and that, that's very suspect as well, because, you know, as, uh, as I wrote, the, uh, you know, it's just all these items are a game of musical chairs, and when music, music stops, um, some of these items uh, find themselves standing alone. So um, that, that indicator right there is quite manipulated, um, and therefore not a true reflection of what's going on. And, um, you know, we see today that uh, oil and, uh, is, is back down again. Um, it tends to uh, type, type in USO here. Um, uh, Dr. K, you might want to switch to, that's not going to give you the right volume. That's uh, for the S&P. So what you might want to do is go here and type in USO here because this will show you the correct volume. Okay. Uh, thanks. The you can see that uh, that is, hold on a second. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, you can see that the the, the commodity market pretty much follows lock and step this year anyway with the U.S. So it's they're very uh, highly correlated. That doesn't always happen, of course. But um, you know, you can see that the commodity research bureau and and oil they're they're struggling. I mean, there's there's no real bottom, you know, real major low is a lot more aggressive to the upside. And right now, it just sounds, it seems to me that this uh, basket of commodities, including oil, is having a tough time. Because you got uh, countries like China that just aren't exerting enough demand on these goods. Uh, because China has its own basket of problems. Um, Europe, too. You know, UK. Uh, around the world, it's, it's been very difficult. So, um, you know, the question is... Uh, whether um, you know the market is actually going to just keep heading higher on these QE fumes, we've noticed all year that it's been reluctant to do so. Um, actually, I'm going to shrink shrink this window, and I'm going to pull up the uh, SPX. Uh, where is it? What's that? Uh, dollar SPX. No, it's not coming up. Oh, there it is. That's, uh, do I have control still? Here, just pull up a, S, a window of SPX. The daily, this this big one, yeah. Uh, 
I still have USO on mine. Now the screen is shrunk again. I just want to show daily of the SPS. It's not updating. It still shows USO. It's like USO stuck on here. Gil, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm just trying to fix this. So there, okay, there we go. You went and screwed everything up. So there, there's the S&P. That's what you're trying to look at. Okay, you're good to go. <laughs> yeah, this, uh, you know me and technology. We don't get along very well, especially when we're thousands of miles away. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Whatever. It's working see. out. Uh, anyway, yeah, I want to actually um, make expand the one else. Yeah, here we go. So you'll see here that... Um, you know the pullback has been relatively orderly on the on on this index, um, and this is the seventh day that it's lower. Um, you'll notice that all year round it's it's kind of had this pattern where it tends to pull back pretty fast over a period of six or seven days, and it gains its some stability, um, and then it starts to go higher. So uh, that was part of the reasoning, um, and also the volatility um, is setting up right for the. Uh, VIX volatility model to go to a buy signal um, earlier today. Uh, so we'll see how the trade works. The risk is element is also very low, which is also why I like the entry position. Because um, I know where the uh, sell the, the sell stop at this time, I know where it's at. It could change, of course, but right now the sell stop is uh, basically less than 3% away. Um, so we're in good shape. And um, Outside of that, uh, you know, the stocks are, you know, they're not, uh, they're not exactly going um, gangbusters because we've got, uh, I think, a lot of overhang, you know, and, and um, if this market starts to head higher from here, then we may get some good setups, or the setups that have emerged may start to move higher because a lot of these stocks have been lagging. Um, they're just kind of spinning their wheels. They're not necessarily uh, selling off hard, but they're they're not really doing what they should. So. Um, from a breadth perspective and a leadership perspective, uh, there are some yellow flags out there. So, you know, as we always say, you know, keep your keep your stops tight, because um, all it takes is a good down day in the major averages to, to pull all of these uh, leading stocks a hell of a lot lower. And with that, I will turn it over to Gil. Uh, you can see the. I think the key point here is the S and P is coming down to the 200-day moving average after running into resistance near the highs. So, I think what's critical here is if we're going to see this rally continue, S and P obviously is going to have to hold the 200-day. I would watch that as sort of a uh, a signal that we might be breaking down if it's, it's unable to hold it. I, I think the action so far argues for further downside today. Uh, although it's you know among individual stocks, it remains a mixed bag. But there's no up thrust. No upside thrust in any of these pukey little names, you know, that have pocket pivots. I think this is the only one that's got any thrust following earnings. But again, you know, you you, you want to buy it into earnings and hope you don't get caught with something uh, like this. Oh, sorry, I'm looking for and no, I'll get it. Give me a second. <laughs> And you hope you don't get caught with something like this on a breakdown. So, you know, a lot of these names, that's what we've noticed, is that they're not making a huge amount of progress to the upside. You look at uh, Paycom, for example. It has a viable gap up, but it just kind of drifts in. Maybe it's going to run into the 10-day. Maybe that's where it would become viable. It looks like the best names, in my view, have been the big cap NASDAQ names. And my two favorites have been Amazon, which uh, I thought was viable right around the 600 level on the viable gap up. And also LinkedIn, which was viable on the viable gap up here. And it's this thing's actually continuing higher. I'm wondering, let's take a look at something here. It, it actually, you can see, I don't know if you guys can see this or not. I'll try and blow it up. Uh, but you can see the see the volume here. It's, it's projecting a pocket pivot, actually, by the close. I think, it, well, I may need to pick up a little bit to get above this bar here. 
which is uh, one, two, three, four, five, which is eight days ago. But if it could clear that, you would have a pocket pit off, pivot off the 10-day line. So, you know, oddly enough, in the midst of the market doing whatever it's doing, you're, you see these big cap names continuing to move higher. And that includes uh, two of my favorites, LinkedIn and Amazon, which have worked after these viable gap ups. And another one has been uh, Alphabet, which I keep calling it Google. It's still Google with a different name. And this thing seems to hold its 10-day line. So interesting that these big cap names are holding up. Uh, Netflix is another one, continues to hold, hold held the 10-day line this morning. It acts like it wants to break out. If you draw a line across these two peaks here, you'll see that this actually right here, this day, uh, which is one, two, three, four, five, seven days ago, was actually a trend line, a pocket pivot trend line breakout or a trend line breakout on a pocket pivot. And you have a pullback down into the 20 line on light volume, 20 day line rather, and it's popping back to the upside. Is this thing going to break out or is it going to break down? So, you know, it's, it's very difficult also to get a handle on where these things are because if you look at Netflix, you know, I've talked about this the last couple of webinars. When it gapped down after earnings, it didn't continue any lower, and it found support along these lows here on the left side, or towards the, well, let's say the center of this base here along these lows, and it found support and drifted to the upside. But you, well, you've seen higher upside volume. It hasn't been above average. And so it's more, to me, a, a matter of, of shorts uh, who didn't get any love here on this gap down. They thought they were going to get it uh, after earnings is going to just blow apart, but it didn't. It drifts back to the upside on light volume. And, uh, and it, you know, it may just be setting up to be shorted again. Apple did that. Uh, if we look at Apple, because it tried to come back up. And if we look at Apple on a weekly, oops, it's the wrong chart. This is what it looks like. And when you look at this, uh, that this just looks like a big head and shoulders. And, of course, you get the massive break down the right side, forms the right side of the head. But the, this also contains within it one failed base, a second failed base here, and actually one, two, three failed breakouts. So now it runs right into the, uh, well, not right into the 40-week line, but just skids above it. But notice how on the weekly chart it never closed above the 40-week line. So it was weak, and then it gapped down on Tuesday, which I saw, I see as a uh, shortable gap down using the 20-day line or the high here at 118.05 or so. Uh, what is the high there? 118.07 uh, as a stop. It may rally. It could rally back up towards the 120 level, maybe even back up to the 200 day, depending on what the market does. But if the market breaks down, I would not be surprised to see this thing just bust uh, to the downside. And I am short the stock. So um, somebody's asking, Scotty, is that you asking that question? How will falling commodity prices possibly influence the Fed's decision? Uh, Looks like deflation to me. Yeah, I guess so, but my response would be, who cares? I'm just going to watch the stocks. We've seen commodities have been weak for a while, and they've been portending continued economic weakness. I don't see where drivers of growth are anywhere uh, in the global economy. So I think that's an issue for the market. And, and getting back to what the Fed's going to do, I would probably pay less attention to that and more attention to what the market does in response, because it doesn't seem like the market's quite made up its mind about whether it likes an interest rate increase or whether it doesn't. And I think you can pretty much throw that out the window and focus more on whether, regardless of what the Fed does, whether we're in a, a position economically and with respect to the global economy where further weakness is in the cards. And if that's the case, you've got trouble. So that's more the, my approach to, to all that and what uh, commodity you know, that, prices. Go ahead, Dr. King. That goes into, you know, what, what we always say, you know, the news is irrelevant, but what is meaningful is how the market reacts to the news in question. Um, so, you know, that we don't, no one can predict what the market's going to do and how it's going to decide um, the, the fate of a interest rate hike right. until we actually see it on the day in terms of the price volume action of leading stocks. And then, then we'll know what we need to do. Um, that's why, you know, all these predictions and stuff, it doesn't, doesn't really hold much meaning or value in terms of making money in the markets. Agreed. So we can just watch what's going on. And I would say, you know, if we're looking at where the market is, uh, things got real rosy. You know, everybody's babbling about how wonderful everything is. And uh, we're right at the peak. And, and remember last time when the NASDAQ cleared 5,000, everybody was ecstatic. That was the peak in July. And the market blew apart over the next month. So, you know, things can change very quickly here. And I think you have to be alert. 
But, you know, that said, my approach is focused on a two-sided or bifurcated uh, view of the market where I'm playing stocks like LinkedIn or uh, Amazon on the upside and stocks like Facebook, you know, I shorted uh, shorted into the, uh, I've been trading this thing all over the place, shorted into the gap up, uh, covered the break yesterday into the 10-day line, turned and went long. Now it's actually holding up. I actually came in short the stock this morning and covered near 108. Just didn't seem to be give, giving uh, giving up much here, and it's also in a strong position. It's going to have to break down further to really confirm weakness. And right now, it's just chopping within its range, which I don't know if any of you have noticed who who are at least oriented towards short term or even day trading. A lot of stocks are just running in place, and they're going back and forth, and very little progress. As somebody uh, points out, there's fewer and fewer ideas on the long side. True, and and they're mostly these big cap names that uh, I think. You know, I brought this up in the last webinar. What does that mean? Why are institutional uh, investors piling into big cap names? I, I would point out that most of these are established names. You know they're going to be around no matter what. Apple, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, Netflix. I don't know about Netflix. Um, Intel, you've seen act well. Uh, Priceline was acting well, but I, I think it's a short now. In fact, what I would be looking for, if you're looking at something to fail like Facebook, uh, here's, remember we talked about this a few weeks ago, how I was skeptical of this base, because it's a big, loose base. If you call it a double bottom, you never undercut the lows here to shake everyone out. So it really becomes this jagged, ugly uh, cup with handle, in a sense, or an improper double bottom, whatever you want to call it. But to me, it looked failure prone because it's a loose base. And so, sure enough, stock breaks out. And it looks great on the breakout right here. And that would have been, what, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago? We were rolling over again. So I think we're heading back to the lows. We're going to go through the lows. I think the market's got problems. And if I'm long, I'm being, I'm playing a protective, uh, playing defense, rather, protecting, looking to protect my profits. So figure out what you're doing. Um, you know, with a name like Amazon, for example, I, I will either use, you know, I don't know if you can see it, but I got a very light five-day moving average here. When something gets accelerating on the upside, I'll either use that or the 10-day as a quick uh, bailout stop, trailing stop. Because in this market, you want to make sure you keep your profit. So, and if you look at Amazon, it's really followed the five-day all the way up. Now, here's uh, LinkedIn tested the 10-day successfully and turned back to the upside and actually making new highs. Uh, which is pretty strong. So, <clears throat> but let's get back to Priceline, which I see. Okay, now you you have a late stage failed base. So we have a late stage base. Let's look at this here. And it's actually, you know, I guess you want to call it extremely late stage. Uh, and here's where the stock's trying to come out to all time highs, and it fails. And now you've dropped below the the. 10-week line here, the 50-day line here, but you're staying below it. So the way I look at it, you could use these highs here, 1336, uh, 1335 here as really tight stops if you want to test a short here, which is what I'll do. I'm, I'm actually shorted right here. And uh, if it pushes you out, then the next stop might be the 20-day because that's pretty common also for a late-stage failed base. It'll, there will be two scenarios where it breaks through the 50-day, pauses briefly and then breaks again for the 200 day then it starts to bounce back and forth between the 200 day and the 50 day and you'll see that happen a lot in this type of situation you can go back and look at a number of these over the last several months but uh, in this position a rally back up to the breakout point or the 20 day moving average is not out of the question and my guess is that it would coincide with what the general market is doing if the general market continues lower this may just bust here if the general market's able to rally from here and bounce, and it may head back to the upside. So it's it's a fluid situation, and you have to figure out how you're going to operate based on what you're seeing in the stock in real time. Because we never know what the, what's going on uh, in the future, what's going to happen in the future. We only know what's going on right now. So somebody says, JJC break into new lows. What, what is that, Dr. K, the copper? Yeah, copper sub. Yeah, there, I mean, there's another one. They're all breaking down. I thought a few weeks ago, I thought you uh, oil was trying to bottom, but it's that's off totally off the table once it failed here. 
And some of these oil names, I was actually trading some of these, and when they're they were good for some brief trades, you know, 10% or so on silica holdings. But now they're rolling over. CLR was another one off the 50-day here. Boom, you get a couple of bucks, three bucks out of it. You take it and you run. And that's kind of how this market uh, rolls. And that's the way I approach it. It's more on a short-term basis. And my thinking has been that we're not in a glorious new bull market. And so trying to play the upside on a longer term trending basis I think is a fool's game but taking what they're going to give you on the upside I think is a very workable strategy if you can figure it out and it, you know it's it's pretty textbook in the sense that a lot of these things like look at this one you know rallies to the top up here um, tries to make another move it finds resistance and so if you bought it down here you sell it there another one that I've been messing around with is this VDSI which I bought down here and you get a buck or so out of it. You know, it's hanging in there, but uh, it's just going back and forth. Um, Infinera is another one that uh, I thought was viable along here. And it's just going back and forth. But see how you get these little 5% jacks, boom, and you can try and trade those if you're oriented that way. But really, it's much easier to make big money when uh, you get a trend. And so the next trend I'm really looking for is a downside trend. I, I still think we're probably in a long-term topping process here, and we're going to go into a bear market uh, that will probably end after the presidential election, when maybe things get turned around. But you know, we just keep going further and further into debt, and I don't see gold as being something that's going to completely come apart. It may pull in, and at some point we'll find a floor. Um, but right now it's just reacting to the whole interest rate uh, play right now and but you're coming to, down towards these lows Let's take a look at this on a longer term basis the weekly chart that's pretty grim but uh, you know we may be coming down look at it you may be approaching some support down at around the thousand level maybe that's where we bottom out on top of this uh, structure here but if the Fed ends up not uh, raising rates, then which I, I think they're not—they're not going to. I think they're going to walk it back and uh, end up not doing anything. Uh, let's see what else. There's been—if you look at the—I've talked about this before too. The, the cyber is a shortable cyber cyber arc, short about the 50-day on earnings, and that blew apart. It undercut this low. If I was short this thing which I talked about it being a short here, uh, I'd be covering down in here and then seeing if you rally up into this 44, 45 level, just underneath this level of resistance. Uh, Palo Alto Networks is another one that looks shortable here along the 200 day the other day, and it comes in. And for the most part, outside of, say, Tesla, I think Tesla is still a uh, longer-term thematic short, and I think it's eventually at least going to undercut this 180 low here. Uh, perhaps go lower uh, and so it became shortable right at the uh, 200 day moving average I was watching for this to uh, potentially try to break out through the 200 day which I, you know I wouldn't put it past it if the general market continued higher the general market ran into some trouble on Monday and Tesla ran into trouble immediately with the market and that tells you it's very weak so at that point it was a short stock has come down filled this gap you can see the gap here on the earnings uh, after the earnings report and it's filled the gap and it's hanging along here may build a slight uh, bear flag but among let's see these others have been pretty weak too but this is just building a bear flag uh, and I think if you're looking at rallies if you got a rally up into the 36 level that would be a juicy short sale point but here what you've done is you're trying to break down and break out to the downside of this little bear flag now you're rallying back up into the underside of that so possibly this could be shorted here using the 10-day line as a stop. It's in a riskier position, uh, and so you know you want to keep that tight because the next stop could be here. So you have that one. You have FireEye, which is just grim, pretty ugly. Here's a nice post-IPO move, and then uh, the breakdown has taken it to new lows, and I think even below its offering price. I think the offering price was what 28 bucks. I forget. What was it, Dr. K on that? 28. The market's rolling over. Markets. Apple's a short. Uh, 20, 20 bucks. 20, yeah, okay. So it's getting there. 
but you know all of these things and, and they don't their, their PEs are off the charts so in a bear market you'll see PEs contract and that always becomes a dangerous proposition so I know LinkedIn is in Amazon are considered high PEs but LinkedIn I think is going to make something close to 11 bucks in a couple of years so they're not it's trading at 50 times earnings uh, is that right 11 bucks what's it if it, in two years it's trading at 257 25 28 times earnings something like that anyways yeah, it's, uh, let's see, it's is yeah. the, uh, realizes that so people are looking at the long-term growth rates, but the stock's extended, so LinkedIn is extended. So I like Apple, though, as a short. I think if the market blows apart, it's going through the 50-day, and I think this turkey's topped. It looks like it to me. The, the test for me was the 200-day. Look look at how you ran up past the 200-day or the 40-week line on the weekly trip, but you run into this area of congestion under, on the lows along the lows of the prior base. So that becomes a short sale point. And I was on the fence with this. Uh, until it just kind of gave way on uh, Tuesday, and I, now I think the gap down. If we if we consider the idea that if we were long the stock and you have a high volume gap down, Dr. K, if you're long a stock and you get a high volume gap down off or near the peak, what do you do? You sit there. Sell it. Sell yeah. it at the open. Always a rule. Always, no question asked. Don't, I mean, it doesn't matter how much it gaps down. In fact, part of the problem is if the stock, if you are if you have not seen the warning signs, when stocks, stocks lose half their value overnight, there's almost always a warning sign. Um, and if you happen to get caught in one of those names, unfortunately, um, and it's down that much at the open, I know a lot of people's tendency is, oh my gosh, I can't sell it at this level. But those are the stocks that usually go even lower than that. So, you know, it doesn't matter how far it gaps down, you just got to sell it at the open. And, you know, lick your wounds and learn your lesson. Yeah, and so on that basis, I consider Apple, if you had owned it, it would have been a quick sell there. And I think you go short using the high of the day at 118, I guess it was 118.07, or the 20-day moving average, which is at um, 117.59, as your stop. And and I think this is going to break. It's just, you just wait it out here and you keep a tight stop. But I would, I mean, if this thing rallied back up towards the 10-day or the 200-day, uh, I would just consider that a juicy short sale point. So the stock sells at what 13, 12, 13 times estimates, but it's growing at seven to ten percent. And uh, I mean, so I was on Twitter earlier. Somebody was kind of missing the point. They're getting into all this actual versus estimates. I'm not sure what they were talking about. Uh, but I think what the bottom line for me is a PE ratio is nothing more or less an indication or a measure of demand that the marketplace is on a company's future earnings stream, period. If you look at Apple when it started its move back in 2004, it was selling for, what, 46 times earnings. Now, when it topped in 2012, it was selling for about 15 times earnings. And by the time it bottomed, minus 42% later, after topping, if we go back on ye old weekly chart here. This is the big break in uh, late 2012, you know, in mid 2012, and we called this. We even wrote an article. Do you remember that, Dr. K? We wrote an article in uh, stock was around here. This is pre-split. I forget what the price was, but we wrote an article in Forbes about it, and some well, guy. Well, article. <laughs> I mean, we were right. But yeah, I couldn't believe we were like uh, it was like sacrilege to say anything against the stock. Right, and and right now everybody loves Apple, and all you hear is that it's cheap, you know. And I don't care if they beat estimates because the bottom line is they had a blowout quarter here, and what happened? So you get these wonderful beating of the estimates, uh, BS, and the stock blows. And here we had a, this was a movement on earnings, and you know I think they're just bringing in the last few suckers to buy the stock, and it's going to come off. It's heading back. I'm saying eventually these lows, maybe lower. Um, that's what it looks like, just like Tesla is heading lower. And the rally that we've seen in it recently, in my view, was at one point or another, depending on how far it rallied. I was thinking maybe get up into the 240 level, just past the 50-day, but it didn't. It broke down. So that just shows you how weak it is. I think thematically this thing is coming down. But Apple more so as one of these beloved uh, must-own, you know, you own it forever. I saw, in fact, I saw a guy on Fox who was babbling about Apple is a stock that you buy and hold forever a couple of weeks ago. He was on TV yesterday. It's like, oh, my God, you need to buy protection. Uh, what, do you, what is it, safe sex or something? You know, you, if you're on the stock and it's going down, you just sell the, the blanker. 
you know. But he's now he's now here's a guy who's like bullish, telling you own it forever. But now you, you have to you need protection. I guess that means you buy put options. Why not just sell the stock? I don't get it. <clears throat> Investing is safe sex. Uh. Anyways, what else we're looking at here? More short skis. Blah blah. blah. And that was a short after earnings. Had to be on it though. But it's deep in its pattern. One of the things I'm looking for is something that's breaking down early. So I still like the price line here. Uh, I am sure what's it doing. It's coming in a little bit. So I want to see a break down to the 200 day. That's 100 points from here. Of course, it's a $1,300 stock. So it's the equivalent. If you buy 100 shares or short 100 shares of this, it's like shorting 1,000 shares of a $132 stock. Okay, or 10,000 shares of a $13 stock. So you can look at it in those terms. Market's heading back to the lows. See, here goes. Uh, Facebook, maybe that's a short here. They seem to like it today, though. Just like LinkedIn. Maybe uh, LinkedIn's going to become a short on the stretch. Let's take a look at this. I'll short stocks near their peaks. So it's something new that I've done, and it works a lot of times. Uh, let's look at LinkedIn, for example. Uh, it's getting extended. Nice bounce off the 10-day. Watch in the 620. So here's the 620. You can see the 6 period is starting to roll, but that's just because the stock is kind of flattening out. Now, you already have a cross here on the MACD lines, and notice how as you were going higher here, the MACD lines are actually compressing and, and reversing off the peak. So, you know, telling you maybe... Uh, Maybe it's got some problems, and it's going to roll over. I mean, not that it has problems, but it's going to pull back and come in. Uh, and that, that'll work sometimes. So I'll, I'll watch some of these things as, as they get extended. And you can watch a MACD or whatever, something to tell you might be overbought. If the general market's rolling in, okay, you know they're going to probably bring these things in. So you can hit it using a 620 chart as a guide, okay? And uh, I'll give you an example. Like, and I'll use this on a very short-term basis. If we go back to... What day did, uh, let's look at when Facebook, so here's a day where we opened up and the stock was already gapping down, I think, and then all of a sudden there was a million shares going off right here, you can see it, and it bottoms out <clears throat> there. Now, if I'm shorting it, I'm watching this, and here you get the cross here, and you see this big sell here, and it hits the 10-day line, it gets close enough to it, and remember, I don't look at 10-day lines. If you look at the chart here, it pretty much hit the 10-day line. I think it was about 20 cents above. But I know a lot of guys and gals out there want to uh, give, the, give the line a hard value, and, and then they try to figure out what moving average they need. Like, this, should it be a 52-day or a 55-day or a 51-day? Uh, to me, a, a moving average is nothing more or less than a fuzzy zone. And you can see that that's always the case. Stocks flit around moving averages, and so they're basically around these fuzzy zones. So... And I think the fact that so many people watch him, it creates a certain Heisenberg principle regarding moving averages. So, you know, I'm watching that. It's coming down to the 10-day the line. It's close enough, but I'm also getting confirmation here on the 620. Guess what that is? That's a cover signal because the stock could logically bounce off after the BGU fails here because it did fail pretty quickly. And now it rallies back up with back within the BGU, BGU range, actually. But it's been stalling around just above 109, I guess close to 110. I don't know what this thing does here, uh, but I'm not. I'm not. Can't say I'm a big fan of it right here. So especially if the general market starts to roll over. Um, <clears throat> but that's how I'll use. You know how I'll work this out, and I'll keep it tight. So if I want to get short LinkedIn here, if the general market starts to weaken, I get a sell signal. Yeah, you could even say you have a sell signal here if you want to test it. Use use a high of the day as a stop. Or the six period line here at 257.62, if you want to work it that way. So, but that's a whole other game. And I think at this point, I could probably write an entire book on day trading and short term trading. I'll call it hit and run trading. Oh, wait, somebody already did that. I think it was Jeff Cooper wrote a book back in the 90s about hit and run trading. So, anyways, I just did explain my 620 chart. So, anyways, you're going to have to pay me more for that. But just look at the chart. The other thing is, I've talked about this, you know, the crosses, the extensions, and understanding using it as a guide and not as a system. So, you know, I would say go back and look at webinars where I've talked about it before. 
maybe I could write a book on it. I don't know. But but it's really just a matter of understanding some basic uh, signals in a stock that are going to force you out. Like if you thought you were going to come in and short LinkedIn right off the opening, and you get this cross right away, you're probably gone pretty quick, or you should be. Um, and if you're long it here and you've got it moving to new highs, you could use this as a, a trailing stop to push yourself out or, or to tampen your position down and make it smaller so you can sit through a pullback if that's all we get. I mean, we, the market could just pull back here and then turn around and go higher, but I think it's a matter of just watching what the stocks do. I know back in July I made a lot of money in August uh, getting back from vacation after uh, the first of, second of August, I think it was. And I was just short a couple of things right right off the bat. Biogen had started to work. If we go back uh, here, uh, this is right where I shorted Biogen. I got a nice break over August in the stock. And there were a couple other things, software or Skywork Solutions rather. Uh, was a short. This is, yeah, here we are, end of July. And I was shorting these. And I had these positions. They were breaking down. I was working them. There was also NXPI doing the same thing. Here we are in July, right in here as it rolled over. And it, it sort of feeds on itself in the sense that it starts working, and so I'm just hitting things left and right as they're setting up. Any little rally I'll run into and, and short it. And what you'll find is when the short side is successful, it's, it feels easy. Okay, So one of the general visceral rules I have is, is if I'm shorting and it doesn't feel easy, I'll just go away and I'll wait. Maybe later in the day it gets easier. Maybe the next day. Maybe the day after. But when you're short at the right time, you make a lot of money fast. So it's not like you're going to miss anything if you're a little bit late. Okay. You don't need to, if you shorted NXP here at the 50 day on this bump or the day after, it really doesn't matter as long as you caught the bulk of this move. Okay. So that's really what you're playing for on the short side. So as I like to say, you know, I need to saddle up to get lucky. So that's basically what you're trying to do on the short side. And when I made big money, I remember in uh, May of 2010 when we had the flash crash, I was just shorting stocks. I didn't know that we were going to blow apart that way. And then I get a little bit lucky or maybe a lot lucky that I started putting in my orders to cover when the Dow was down 500 uh, on May 6th. I think it was May 6th of 2010. And that thing ended up coming down a thousand points just about, I think, under, a little over or under, I forget. But all my orders went off uh, by the time they got into the flood of orders coming into the market. Uh, they got hit uh, right near the lows, and I covered. And that was kind of lucky because I could have lost uh, 20, 30 percent of my gains pretty quickly if I didn't cover into that crush of liquidity. So that's all we're doing on the short term. We're just trying to get into position here. Zyop, somebody's asking. I don't know. What do you want me to tell you? It's just trying to move back to the highs. Yes, buy it. It's a great new leader. It's going to break out and go higher. And you should just buy it. I mean, this is a big sloppy base. I'm not going to buy this thing up here. <clears throat> and Trexon is its cousin. And uh, it's tried to get going after earnings. You see this pocket pivot here, but it just runs into 200 day and and uh, runs into trouble. I, you know, I, I wouldn't be messing with biotechs here and thinking you're going to make some big money again like you did uh, the last time if you were lucky enough to to avoid some of the nightmares like this. But you know, to me, the whole the whole biotech space is uh, there's a million great stories out there and compelling uh, scientific developments and this and then and that's true and some of them do come to fruition and they make a lot of money, but eventually. But a lot of these are just money losing situations that break down. So I'm looking at the big stock biotechs that do make money and what they're doing because I think that's a clue as to what the overall group uh, is likely to do. And what you're seeing here is Gilead breaking below the 200 day moving average. I think this is a short using the 200 day line uh, as a stop. Watch Amgen as well. It's starting to do the same exact thing. Um, and I think be open to the fact that if the volume doesn't pick up, you could see it flip back to the upside. So you want to use the 200 day or the high of today here with similar to Gilead as a quick stop if you're going to test the short side. Um, Biogen. Let me just look at it. Yeah, it's hanging along the 50 day. It's acting like it wants to go higher. But it, if you look at the weekly chart, it has some room to rally if it wants to. But it could just, if you notice now, if you want to draw this as a giant 
see because you have this big break that can be considered the right side of a head and shoulders but you can also see there's kind of a head and shoulders uh, in here so the head this big head is also composed of a sort of a pinhead type of head and shoulders so you start to get this fractal thing going on and now you have this bigger head and shoulders with these uh, shoulders and you've broken down through the neckline here and you're rallying up into overhead resistance so this becomes a logical point for it to fail so if the market rolls over Biogen probably will retest these lows and it's probably the ugliest of all of these you look at Celgene is really just starting to break down so you know on this weekly chart it, it looks like a topper you know that, that doesn't look good at all and Gilead looks like it may be on the verge of doing what Celgene has already done Amgen also looks like it's uh, on the verge of doing the same thing so you know, these are all late stage failed bases and the biotech area was very hot and there was a lot of money to be made if you played it right so if you sit there too long like most of my broker friends do you know they call me and brag about their TTPH all the way up like this but you never hear a peep out of them uh, when this happens so you know if you played this and you sold into the run somewhere that was smart if you didn't you're a moron uh, and you don't know shit about the market as far as I'm concerned. But, you know, broker stories, they're all over the place. Um, and I think the biotech area is probably the biggest and most fertile ground for broker stories. Oh, you, they have, they're going to have this new drug. I mean, when, when if anybody ever watched the movie uh, The Wolf of Wall Street, what, is, what is the, one of the hot IPOs they had was a biotech. You, you know, you always got to have one of those if you're into spec baloney. Uh, that's, that's de rigueur, you know. The penny stock biotech, right, Dr. K? There's a million of them out there. Oh, yeah. Uh, anyways, let's see. We got another 15 minutes or so. I'm just letting these things kind of slide down. Apple's starting to give it up. Priceline came all the way up back in from the 1331 level, or 1336 level. Here it is, 1323. But it's barely, it's really not doing anything yet. So we'll see if I get lucky. Uh, I like the UA as a short, um, shorted here, shorted it uh, along the 20-day yesterday, actually. You notice how this thing breaks and rallies, so it's kind of, uh, and then breaks again. It, it's kind of running in place, but it looks to me like it's ready to blow. And if you look at it on a weekly chart, you're getting a head and shoulders here along the top. It's had a huge run. Look at this thing. That's a long run. I think it started here. I bet that's 2009, isn't it? Somewhere around, yeah, when the Fed started printing money and it just runs and runs and runs. And now maybe we're getting to a late stage position where we start to top. You've definitely got the biggest weekly volume on the downside in the pattern here. And when I was at O'Neill, the old timers there, the old institutional guys, one of the things they used to sell to the clients was this idea that if the stock has had a long run and it tops or rolls over on the biggest uh, weekly volume in the pattern, that's trouble. Now, I would say when you saw this one here, that at that time was probably the biggest downside weekly volume in the pattern. So it, it turned around and went higher. But we're in a QE market. Now you get this bigger one. Maybe you put this one together with this one, and you're getting the sense that institutions have been selling into this run, and uh, maybe it's it's time for it to blow. So all I know is I think it's a short when it rallies up to the 20-day. I'm short the stock looking for it to get at least to the 200-day in the near term. That would send it undercutting this low here, which is uh, 8801, uh, 200 days at 8702, that's how I look at that trade. So, Apple's hovering around the 116 level. Any other ex excellent questions here? I notice uh, some That's pockets of strength, which probably just means the next things to come down, is GoDaddy after the Bible gap. You had to pull back here into the 30 level, and boom, you're off to new highs. Now, the trick here is uh, this looks like, this is scaled. You know, I'd look at it probably this way. Let me spread it out. So it looks less severe, but it is kind of a deep uh, cup. And it's, try it's coming up the right side. So the other issue here is this going to turn into an IPO pod or punch bowl of death. So I wouldn't get a big woody for this one here unless you're going to try and buy it closer to the lows of uh, the Bible Gap Up Day. So 
Let's see. No other questions, huh? DDDY equals giddy market. Hey, that's funny, Scotty. Maybe so. Maybe so. Uh, I don't know if it's that giddy, though. You don't see a lot of things running. I mean, a lot of these small cap names just don't get any thrust in them. Or they're choppy. You know, there, what was it? there was one of them. Di was it Dicom? Yeah, this thing, pocket pivot goes nowhere. Pocket pivot goes nowhere. Pocket pivot goes nowhere. Finally, it comes out, but it's still kind of jagged. But you're not making any huge progress. Now, does this get going later on? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. But... It just strikes me as having very little thrust because the market, let's think about it, it's been going up since late uh, September, really. You could say this was a low, but I, I think it really got going in late September. And you've had a sustained rally, but in the meantime, you haven't seen a lot of stocks correlating to that rally. And I think that's an issue. And it just shows you that we're highly rotational. Everything flips back and forth. And it's mostly big caps and junk off the bottom that's led the rally. So it's a little bit suspect. It doesn't mean it can't continue going higher, but it does make it perplexing for anybody trying to make big money on the long side. So, TFANG are the only leaders. What is that? Oh, Facebook, Apple, uh, Netflix, Google. Yeah, Amazon's hanging in there too, but... Maybe not for long. I don't know. Netflix almost looks like a short, too. This is another one I've been thinking. I'm, I'm waiting for it to see if it'll uh, roll over here because it's just kind of wedging up into resistance here. And you could use the 115 level, maybe a little higher, 116 if you wanted to, a couple of percent. That's really nothing as a possible uh, stop or the high of the day here on the 620 chart. But you can see you've already got the cross on the MACD. Okay. And you may be looking at possibly heading to the downside. Hmm. Looks like it's kind of ledging here. I just shorted a thousand shares just for fun. We'll see what happens here. If it starts to break, I'll build a position. But if it doesn't, I think last week I shorted some Facebook um, early in the day, and that actually ended up working. Um, I was on the Bible Gap at day, I think. Uh, sometimes it doesn't work right away, but it did. And then Netflix, 114, so we'll see what happens here. But I'd be watching this. Confirmation would be a 620 break. And for me, a 1% move back to the upside, I might want to put more out there depending on how it acts uh, based on the volume that I'm seeing. I really do think that uh, the intraday game has become very uh, playable in this market. I mean, it's I've been trading Forex for a little while now, and, and it's so much like it, it's it's almost ridiculous. And remember the... the um, uh, what are you guys all shorting that Netflix? All of a sudden, I'm watching it starting to dip. Okay, I'm just going to cover it and take my dime. What's that worth? 100 bucks? I can buy some sushi for lunch. How's that? Um, no, Tesla's down now. So, Donnie. Anyways, um, we'll see what happens here. Oh, uh, what else? We always got to do a real time trade. Dr. K, do you have a real time trade for everybody? Not right now. <laughs> it was Hunter. <laughs> Uh, we should charge extra for that. Watch Gil trade in real time. Yeah. We'll probably get whiplash or something. Uh, let's see. I'm going to, uh, because somebody asked and nobody's asking other any other questions, I'm just going to do a review of the 620 chart. Okay, let's make it nice and big. That. Okay, how's that? There we go. So we'll look at it on Netflix. All right, what do you got? You got an orange six-period exponential. So each period is five minutes on a, a five-minute chart, which is what this is. And uh, six of those periods are what this moving average is based on. So 30 minutes of time, basically, is what this moving average is. It's exponential. This is 20 periods, so 20 times five is uh, 100, uh, which is uh, less than an hour. Is that right? No, wait. What am I thinking? No, no, no. No, no, no. It's an hour, almost man, that hour and 40 minutes. Am I right? I don't know. I can't, I can't add anymore. Where's my calculator? Anyways, it's a 20 period. Uh, 100, uh, 20 times 5 is 100 minutes. That's an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, okay. See how smart I am? That's what a Stanford education does for you. But now it's breaking. What are you guys doing? You're all selling this thing? All right. Just for that, I'm shorting another 1,000. That's it. I'm pissed. 
I would have gotten short 5,000 if I knew you were all going to knock it down 30 cents for me. Anyways. Uh, somebody says we need a GoPro camera on your head. We were talking about that at the uh, at the HCS Investor Conference. That would put people to sleep pretty quick. Let's see. You'd see me uh, looking at my screens, a couple of clicks, uh, you know, run downstairs, get some yogurt, and see, come back upstairs. I don't know. What would a GoPro look on your head, Dr. K? Would it, would it be more exciting than with me? <laughs> I think people will get a bit dizzy, especially with all the multitasking that I do. Okay, yeah, so you'd see him doing a bunch of stuff on his computer, but you probably won't be able to figure out what he's doing. But in any case... I'm up to 500, 500 windows on my Google Chrome. So <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> That's got to be a record of some sort. So I have, um, on my Google Chrome, I have uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I have 7. How am I doing? Am I, is that above average? I don't know. Uh, okay, now we're just babbling. Okay, so anyways, let me get back to this. Thing. So you got six period exponent, twenty period. You got the MACD is set to six, twenty, nine, and C for close. So that's an the nine and the C are automatic on e signal. I have to change the six and the twenty. So you basically have a six line and a twenty line. And and what I look for are correlations. A lot of times you also have to watch what the stock is doing relative to what's going on in the chart. So what I was talking about with LinkedIn, and LinkedIn's hanging in there, is that uh, we can see that as it moves higher, as the price moves higher here, um, you know what, what would be nice to have would be some sort of a, like a crayon or something, or a marker that I could mark on the chart. It says, go to Webinar, offer that, I don't know. Option, I, I'm going to have to check this out later, but I don't see any buttons for it. Anybody know? G Pro new low, yeah, that's a dog. But anyways, you notice how it's going higher, and the MACD starts to diverge here, and you get a cross right here. So you could short the stock right there and, and keep a really tight stop on it, with the idea that this is showing you weakness because the MACD lines are contracting, the histogram is contracting as the stock is moving higher. And so you could short it if you think it's extended, and the general market's going to roll over. So I kind of put that together. Because a leading stock is definitely going to pull back with the market. And a lot of times in this market, you get some pretty nice pullbacks that you can make 5-10% uh, very quickly on. Anyways, what confirms it later is a breakdown of the 6-period line through the 20-period line on the price chart. So it correlates. So first you get the cross here usually, and then you get a cross there. And then that's when you can really come after it. So, you know, we're watching Netflix here. It's... Uh, you notice how the six period line is starting to turn down. You already had the cross here, but the same sort of thing is going on. As it moves higher, the MACD is not pushing as high. It's losing some upside thrust. You're starting to flutter around in here. So you get this decent cross, and you could come after it there. And then when it confirms, then you can really go after it. And then use a buy signal when the line crosses back above, or if you get a cross back here or, or a stretch, uh, then that's another, uh, another way to... To uh, use to, to instill it or put a trailing stop in your position. Okay, I'm sure that all made perfect sense to you. But uh, you know, it can also stop me out of a short position. So, like I was pointing out earlier, uh, being short the other day on uh, Facebook, as it broke down. When was that? It was this day, being short at the turn here. That was the cover point. Okay, when you had the cross. And you had already gotten the MACD cross here. Interesting thing here is you quickly saw the, the MACD rev up. And then it sort of weakened as you got later in the day. And you see how you started to get a, a cross here, but it didn't quite happen. And a lot of times what will happen is if you see the cross on the MACD here, okay, but you don't get a cross here, you try and short that. Now what happens, as it rolls over and it looks like you're going to get a 620 cross to the downside to confirm the weakness, the problem at that point that I'll usually look at is you've already had the MACD kind of stretch out on the downside, and now this is looking like it wants to turn. So you, it generally won't happen that way. And and so that would be a cautionary sign. You have to ask yourself, is the MACD in a position to turn back to the upside? Has it become a little oversold on a short-term basis? And you can see it really doesn't go anywhere for the rest of the day. And then uh, nothing really happening. But it might be starting. Look at how right now it's starting to cross. Although eh, it's a little iffy, but it might work. This might happen. Let's see. Netflix is coming in a little bit. You guys hit it some more for me, will you? 
crayon symbol in upper left on oh okay normal and let's see oh I love it oh this is great now how do you uh, clear these things out erase all drawing oh okay we're in business now you guys this is a breakthrough for the VOSI webinars I can now draw things this could be a curse it could be a blessing a little of both I don't know uh, thanks for that by the way that's awesome okay so now you know so you're looking for the we got the cross going on right here I don't like this color though I want to I want to change my color choose pen color what, what should I use what's going to contrast with everything here let's use uh, how about a dark green yeah that's good all right anyways you see it is holding so because you, you, you're kind of stretched down here um, Netflix is holding but we'll see what happens. But but anyway, so that's what I'm looking for. And that's basically how I use it. You can also watch for a MACD stretch. You see how the MACD lines stretch and get really high. And short term, you could have shorted that. You get a quick break to the downside. So I use I originally uh, devised this messing around with Forex, trading foreign exchange currencies, as you know them. And then I realized that the, the way this market is, is it's such a funky vol intraday volatile sort of game here that you could apply the 620 chart to ETFs and started doing it with the UVXY and then I realized you could start it using it uh, with respect to uh, stocks and then it became one of you know adding to my arsenal of methods to control risk management on the short side I began to use it more on the short side so and I've used something similar to that since uh, 2010 but it was really the 620 chart is when it got more refined and I know Dr. K uses a, a more shall we say advanced version um, but I don't think you need to get too complicated with it uh, it's mi more, mainly a tool go I, ahead Doc. what that's a, I would say keep it simple I um, you know that's a big part I think of refining a system is making it simpler uh, making it as simple as possible um, but no simpler than needed okay well wow, we're already at nine o'clock and do I have to Okay. You can see Netflix starting to uh, looking like it's going to break here, but you're already way down in here. You see that? So I don't know. We'll see. Gee, now that I figured all this out, now we got to end the uh, webinar. I'm all excited. I just want to draw things. You know? so, I'm trying to draw my cartoon character. Uh, how's that? Is that talent or what? Relive the Doopy days. The Doopy days, yeah, here he is. Doopy the trader, maybe we'll bring him back. Anyway, he's got to color in. That's just going to be too hard. But anyways, uh, there he is. I, see, I can still draw him. Look at that. Uh, this is pretty difficult. But in any case, uh, this, this should be helpful in the next webinar. Maybe we'll do another one. I'll do a short selling webinar in the next couple of days. How's that? And I'll be able to use this. Anyways, thanks for uh, cluing us in on that. You see, how, see how clueless we are? We don't even know what the hell's uh, on these programs. Probably a lot of other things we can use. Maybe I need to take a, a webinar uh, course on uh, <laughs> on this. In any case, you guys, that's really all we have. I think I, I've given you some ideas to work with. I hope on the short side, the long side. You know, watch for some of these names coming into 10-day moving averages into areas of support. But I still think. You're in an environment where it's a short-term trader's game until we develop a more concerted or, or definite trend. But at the same time, I tend to think that the next big trend is going to be to the downside. So despite the fact that I'll play names like LinkedIn or Amazon on the upside, and they've been working, and a few others you know, for some quick trades, um, it's, just, uh, it's just not anything sustained. And so I'm thinking if I can keep working the short side and try to get my – hopefully get myself into position at the right time maybe we catch another leg down in a in a continuing bear market and that's kind of what I'm looking for but the market never gives you what you want so I'll just take what it gives me and I'm happy in the meantime so anyways now how do I get this stupid thing to shut down there we go whoops um, take that off okay whoops there we go anyways you guys Thanks for showing up. We'll catch you next week. Take care. How long?